Hey there, everybody. It's James Lindsay. You're listening to the New Discourses podcast. And as threatened on Twitter, I'm going to do a podcast kind of about theology. Actually, I'm not really going to do what people are either looking forward to or fearing um, in this podcast, but I'm going to talk about theology. I'm going to take theology quite seriously. I'm probably not going to use the definition of theology that you're used to. I'm not also going to use my own definition of theology. Um, just going to tell you the story to get started. I recently had the pleasure of being invited to speak at the University of Dallas in Dallas, Texas, which is a small Catholic college um, or university. Um, and while I was there, I was given a couple of books, which I will confess at this point, I've only read the preface and introduction, which is about 60 pages of one of them. Um, both of these books, though, are by the same author. Uh, his name is John Henry Newman. He was a uh, Catholic thinker in the mid 19th century. So one of these two books is called The Idea of the University and the preface and introduction that I read by Newman himself and the uh, person who wrote the foreword. Uh, but Newman's preface was written in um, 1852, if I believe correctly, to give you a sense of the date. And the, again, the title of this book is The Idea of the University. And so this has been a very interesting read. And I'll kind of summarize what I've got out of it so far. Of course, I haven't read Newman's actual argument. I'm looking forward to it, but time is my actual mortal enemy at this point. Uh, so I'm going to, I am definitely very interested in getting through this. Yeah, if you're interested, the other book is The Grammar of Ascent. I'm also I'm more interested actually in that one. But just so you know, I'm about to start turning my my attention toward education. And so I want to consider this to be kind of a preamble podcast that connects a previous one that I did to the direction of education. Not that that's actually necessary to do. I just think it actually is interesting that my thought is bridging this gap and I can share that with you. Um, and what I mean by that is that first of all, you know, the idea of the university gives a, gives a positive view of, of what education should look like and how it should operate as you would imagine by the title. Um, you know, the ideas articulate philosophically, what is the idea of a university? And uh, kind of secondly, um, I think starting with a positive vision is very important, but I think secondly, it also bridges the gap to um, my podcast I did recently about the emerging uh, marketplace of ideas, right? The a lot of people were, took that very positively. So just chat about it for a second. You know, the, the the thesis I had there was that the marketplace of ideas did not emerge in the Enlightenment. The Second Enlightenment is upon us. That Second Enlightenment is, in fact, um, going to bring about a real marketplace of ideas where people get to do their own research, etc. And I put forth this as this challenge that we have to figure out, you know, we can look, for example, at John Locke, and we can say Locke laid out in the first enlightenment that there's some intrinsic relationship that's so important but that we need to secure between man and and, and, and what, what he can do in terms of being free, some huge thing uh, to where he said that life, liberty, and property have to be secured as rights. And of course, Marxism in Marx's own words, Marx and Engels in the Communist, uh, Communist Manifesto in chapter two, explicitly say uh, that uh, communism can be summarized in a single sentence, which is not a sentence, abolition of private property. Maybe it is a, a sentence in the original German, I don't know. But in the English translation, it certainly is not a sentence. Abolition of private property contains uh, no verb. Um, but he also points out, of course, that the goal isn't to abolish all properties, to abolish bourgeois property. If you pay attention to what I talk about with critical race theory, whiteness is bourgeois property. That's Cheryl Harris's 93 whiteness is property paper. Um, and so whiteness becomes bourgeois property. And so critical race theory is the, the communist manifesto would, could be reframed and just say that it's the abolition of, of whiteness, the abolition of bourgeois property and racial property. Um, so but the, I digress. Uh, something was in, is intrinsic to what Locke was saying. And obviously, there is no freedom, for example, if you don't have 
uh, at least the freedoms of life and property uh, secured against the government, uh, which has a monopoly of force. If you can be threatened credibly with your life, or you might die as they might have during the Enlightenment for expressing your opinions, then you don't, you're not free to express your opinions, and we don't actually have freedom. We don't. There's no possibility of a marketplace of ideas. But secondly, no marketplace of ideas can exist if you also don't have a fundamentally protected right to your property. If the government can seize your property for having the wrong opinions, or, uh, or even liberty, if it can imprison you for expressing the wrong opinions, then you can't express your opinions freely, and therefore we are not going to have a marketplace of ideas. So a marketplace of ideas emerging and thus an entirely new political order that we would broadly say the liberal and modern political order can't exist without the securing of life, liberty, and property. Because uh, what a very simple argument. If they can kill you, if they can imprison you, or if they can take away what your ability to um, a place to live and uh, means of procuring basic needs like food, uh, then they can control you and you you, there is no possibility of a marketplace of ideas if that's connected to your ability to speak or not speak uh, or be compelled into speech or any of these other things that the freedom of speech actually entails philosophically. And so Locke was onto something. And now what I say is that what actually emerged from that, we, are, we emerged out of a magisterial state, um, which is in fact very much almost in parallel to kind of a, I don't want to say that magisteria are slave, uh, like a slave thing, but you best basically have these priests and, and in a sense, uh, information rulers who uh, kings and, and priests and popes and things like that, who tell you what you are and are not allowed to believe. Then you have this reformation that sparks this off, which is a huge revolution in that regard. And I say that we transitioned into in a kind of an estate based or an estate kind of an economy regarding information rather than a true marketplace of ideas. And that was what the first enlightenment actually accomplished. We get out of magisteria where monarchical episcopates to kind of summarize them as one thing, but it's not quite right to do that, uh, dictate what you can and cannot, uh, know or express, uh, at least they, they are the arbiters of information for the entire society. If we think of the information as a different form of economy, uh, and then we transitioned into one where now we have experts and institutions that are going to be the arbiters of what is and is not true. Like literally we've had a kind of, we no longer had a literal ministry of truth, which of course in 1984, when you worry about the ministry or look at the ministry of truth or in any of these kind of dystopian pictures of ministry of truth, you, you see it as a clear regression to a magisterium information economy. Uh, and we, we, we abhor that. But what people didn't, I think fully realize is that we did not actually, even though we had free speech, uh, secured through life, liberty, and property. Um, we did not actually have a marketplace of ideas. That's my argument now. We had a, a uh, aristocracy of ideas. So experts, not to discount expertise in its true form, but experts in the institutions that credential them and the institutions that promote and house them uh, become the new aristocracy. And you end up with this whole um, kind of social ordering and politics that you're trying to be acceptable to the uh, information or aristocrats or the information estates so that you don't get excluded from them. Because if you're excluded from them, very smart people, you damn well know that your ideas aren't going to get taken seriously. They're not going to get published. So all of the kind of publishing gatekeeping, all of the academic gatekeeping, et cetera, all indicates that this is an aristocracy. And the very smart people, by the way, therefore, are people who are craving to be uh, allowed to play in the feudal ground or the, the, the lordly grounds, the estate grounds or even to be allowed into the castle, depending. And they're willing to basically subvert who they are and become these kind of, I don't know, I would actually say clowns to uh, be able to participate in, in that. And so what I see is that the internet has been another revolution. The, Re the Reformation, frankly, followed the, uh, it rose in tandem with the printing press. You could now publish Bibles in the vernacular language, for example, uh, of Europe, you could, well, it was, it was a capital crime, but you could, it was physically possible to do it. You could publish pamphlets and pamphlet wars arose and so on, um, changed the entire political economy. And all of a sudden the ability to speak that Locke was trying to secure through his life, liberty and property, um, arguments for rights became very important and very pertinent. And that's where people started to talk about them. And Locke said that it was the 
uh, it is necessary to a, a free a free state to secure those rights from tyrannical governments to prevent their infringement. And now, of course, we see this attempt to either maintain or transform or, or take this backwards. In fact, what we see is information Bolshevism, which if you want, you can frame that in a very simple way, which is that in the Bolshevik rev revolution, a peasant feudal economy in Russia was jumped forward into a or really just transmogrified into a new peasant feudal economy under the Soviet rule under Lenin. So Bolshevism is not a progressive movement. Bolshevism is a uh, revolution in who gets to be the aristocrats. Um, and then, of course, because it's a catastrophe, it fell backwards into uh, a broadly slave economy uh, that was, was very injurious and murderous, etc., uh, as they tend to be. Uh, very, um, very destructive, exploitative, genocidal even. And so, what you have happening now is kind of information Bolshevism with the level of tech companies. Their goal is to control speech. It's to that what they see is the emergence, the potential emergence of a free system, and they want to stop the marketplace of ideas from uh, emerging because it will depose most of these stupid elites from their power. It will show their corruption. It will show their criminality. It'll show their ineptitude. It'll show the limitations where they've been able to prop themselves up as the arbiters of knowledge and the sources and the gatekeeping of knowledge and, and information. And it's going it, to, it's deposing them already. And they want to jump into a new aristocracy by controlling the flow of information. And very much like you have with the Chinese situation with the firewall, their information firewall, they effectively do have something like a ministry of truth in that regard, but also the social credit score. So that if you express the wrong opinions, they can, they can clamp down on you and control you, et cetera. Uh, if you're even around people who express wrong opinions, you can be controlled. So they want to skip into a, a administered in a information economy. That's like the abuses of a uh, dictatorial or abuses of socialism, the dictatorship of the, of the information technocrats or of the, the, whatever you want to call them. They want to jump over the freedom stage, but what's happening is the the uh, information economy, uh, the free one, the the real marketplace of ideas is emerging. People can use the internet to do their own research. I mean, we I, I, I've trot this out as an example a lot, but it's profound that a man in India taught himself using YouTube videos to throw a javelin and won a gold medal in the Olympics five years later. Uh, that's a profound change in what expertise represents and how it can be accessed and how anybody can access it versus just literally, you know, not that many years ago. Uh, we could trot out lots of examples, you know, picking holes in various aspects of, we'll just say, the narrative or the science. Uh, it happens very, very, very quickly. We're, we're not seeing, for example, anything that looks like a kind of color revolution false flag. It's like people cottoned on real quick to what's going on with those, and those don't fly like the internet picks them apart and it feds everywhere uh, very, very quickly, very credibly. Um, so we're in this new information situation. And what this, so I th thought this was supposed to be a podcast about theology. I haven't said a thing about it. Well, this is where Newman kind of comes in because what we're actually talking about is in, in some regard, in kind of very Lockean fashion, is where we have to talk about man's relationship to meaning. And that is where theology is going to become relevant. I don't know what the parallel is. I understand it's very clear how your liberties, uh, particularly your freedom to speak and to freedom of conscience and freedom to worship are all, uh, they all require the, the uh, freedom, or the securing, I should say, of your inalienable rights, protection of, of, of your inalienable rights from the government uh, of life, liberty, and property. And that argument is very simple. Um, something similar to this needs to be occurring, however, within the uh, information space. Uh, because here, you don't necessarily face, you could, it could go there. And in some countries, it is that you could be imprisoned. So your liberty could be infringed upon your, your inalienable right, right to liberty for expressing wrong opinions on social media, for example. And that is happening in some places. Uh, it's so far, I don't think we're seeing life uh, threatened, but that's possible. You could express wrong opinions and they could kill you. This has happened throughout history. Of course, it could easily happen here. We shouldn't be so arrogant as to believe it couldn't. Um, property, uh, fines are a means of seizing property. So it's very easy to see that that could go that way. It could get much more extreme. Land acknowledgements could be construed as admitting that you're on stolen land. That's not protected by the fourth amendment in the United States, for example. And so land seizures would be very easy. Um, th but there are other means now to, to do these things. For example, 
um, you could be banned from social media. So now you can't participate in the uh, overarching dialogue in a way that uh, that enables you to to be fully participatory in public life. You could be banned from your bank account. That happens to people. You could be banned from credit cards. That happens to people. Uh, there are lots of things that could happen. You could. There was another example I had in mind, and I've, I've kind of lost it at the moment. But it, it had to do with with property. Um, you you could be fined for having the wrong opinions, of course, too. So there are lots of ways. Oh, I was thinking of BlackRock. I was thinking of the ways that they could maybe you know use this unrealized gains tax that they're tr- floating to, of course, use inflation to inflate house prices and then say the property values, I should say, and then uh, artificially and meaninglessly, and then say, well, your house doubled in value. So you owe massive amounts of tax because it's technically unrealized gains. And so now we're going to put a lien against your property because you can't pay your taxes. And now we're going to seize your property. So there are all kinds of means that they can use within this new high tech circumstance that we're in to, um, they're all really information based, even economics is in a sense information exchange. Uh, and so there are all these new tools that they can use to uh, impose tyranny upon us. And it all comes down in a sense to our relationship to meaning. And that's where Newman's views are going to become very interesting. Uh, and I'll point out, by the way, that this is all not new. Newman being Newman was a Catholic, and the Catholics were throughout England by the Anglican Church completely excluded for, I forget what it worked out to, 170-something years from basically any significant position in higher education. And part of Newman's argument when he's making this point is that by being excluded uh, in that regard, that uh, Catholics were stuck in kind of a stunted uh, state where they, they couldn't intellectually develop even within their own enclaves as well as they might otherwise which is probably true. And secondly, that they couldn't have the cultural impact that they could otherwise if they had been able to hold university posts or whatever openly as Catholics. And so, uh, you know, I'm not going to say that Newman was oppressed, not not like uh, others earlier in his line, like Thomas More was literally oppressed, um, again, by the Anglicans uh, for being Catholic. But I will say that, uh, you know, he was he was aware of this idea of kind of a soft power of exclusion and was writing from that position. Now, I'm not claiming at all to be a Newman expert, and I don't, I'll get to the Newman in a minute. I'm just going to kind of go through these notes I took while I read the preface and introduction, and that's going to be my theological discussion and the importance of the role of theology and understanding what theology is and means. Uh, and this is, again, like I said, going to be a bridge to my discussions about education that are going to be forthcoming probably for most of the, I don't know how many, but a large proportion of the next 30 podcasts are probably going to be a, around education. Um, I'm going to really do a deep dive into critical pedagogy and what's going on in our schools in that regard. I mean, it's a theoretical level. It's what I do. And I'm sorry, I'm not going to probably be as practical as some of you activists need me to be, but I'm going to give you the understanding you need to do what you need to do. But what I want to say before I get into the to the Newman thing, and I'll come back to this, I guess, repeatedly as I go through that, is we are actually in a state now with the emergence of this new um, marketplace of ideas, this actually free marketplace of ideas that's not actually an aristocracy of ideas uh, posing as a marketplace because people have free speech and free conscience, that we now have this... Um, we have this need to understand something in parallel to the rights of life, liberty, and property. Of course, those must extend as they already have, and we need to figure that out. But we also have to figure out something that the postmodernists were extremely good at dissolving, which is, in fact, a relationship to meaning. Um, and it, as a bookmark, I don't think this is right yet. I'm just throwing this out there as a bookmark. Uh, I've actually said that we should have something like a right to our intention. Um the impact versus intent thing, of course, is just infused with repressive tolerance and is totally biased. Uh, the leftists, of course, want their intentions to count. So when they're disastrous policies, they're Marxists or whatever, they don't work. They say, well, we were good intended. And then on the other hand, um, 
you know, if somebody says something and they can claim offense and intentions didn't matter, uh, intentions and in, in discrimination policy don't matter uh, or in discrimination law don't matter because it's disparate impact. Impact over intent is a core idea that they, they've embraced. But we should have a, a fundamental right to our um, intentions. If I said something clumsily and did not intend anything, we should be able to be able to talk as two people. And this is uh, the dignity culture thing to negotiate what I actually meant. And the defense wasn't intended, but did occur. And that there's a way around that, uh, you know, we can, we can deal with that as adults. And this is, of course, if you've read, um, Manny and Campbell's rise of victimhood culture, they talk about this issue quite a lot, the shift from a dignity based culture where people would work that out as adults between one another to a victimhood based culture, where now you're going to bring in external authorities to adjudicate for you, uh, which is something that dignity cultures do say with courts and mediators, but only in the last resort, um, trying to get individuals to take that uh, position for themselves first. But um, if I, my intentions should matter and we should have a fundamental right to our intentions so that if I say something and had, for example, no racist intention whatsoever behind it, uh, it's not, it should be very difficult to credibly accuse me that racism occurred, not very easy to accuse me of that credibly. And it could be sexism, misogyny, offense. It doesn't really matter. Racism is just kind of the critical race theory example everybody's sort of aware of. Could be alt-right intent or reactionary intent. No, I, I should have, if I'm putting forth an argument in good faith, uh, then the argument should be able to, the, that intention should be able, should count for something. And we, on some level, must have some kind of a right to this, that, that the death of the author that Roland Barthes uh, outlines, or the, the Jack Derrida, Jackie Derrida, actually, his real name is Jackie, not Jack. Uh, look it up. It's true. I'm not casting shade at him like a lot of people think. His real name is actually Jackie Derrida, uh, spelled the American way, uh, J-A-C-K-I-E. Look it up. It's true. Uh, so, you know, that he absolutely dissolves through his linguistic deconstruction project is post-structuralism. Um, that, that, that meaning is only, you know, meaning is infinitely deferred and there's, there's no way anyone can clearly understand one another. There must be something though there that somebody else doesn't get to interpret my words, my ideas for me, uh, my, and divine my intentions out of them and have authority over my own. When it comes to say, if, since we're going to dip into theology or whatever, when it comes to the the interpretation of scripture uh, or the interpretation of any text, um, an eisegetical approach should not be able to outweigh one that is seeking authorial intent. So seeking authorial intent should actually, because what the author wrote and meant, should mean something in terms of conveyance. And this gets very deep into the philosophy of language. What is language for? I think this is one of my favorite little hobby horses. I've thought about this for many, many years. Language is for creating a shared set sense of intention or shared intentionality uh, so that I have a, some idea in my head. I use language to express it so that it can get out of the lock, the perf perfect subjective lock. Everything in my head is subjectively locked in my head and you don't have access to it. We don't have Neuralink yet and hopefully won't. Uh, you don't know what's going on in my head. You can't know and that ambiguity creates all kinds of problems. Uh, but I have this tool called language which can be symbolic. I could draw a picture, for example, if you, know, you see this, actually, it turns out in, in China a lot when they're speaking, because there's so many words that are pronounced the exact same way that they'll actually draw the character on their hand to, to communicate to somebody which one they mean. Um, but I could actually just draw a picture, you know, of the thing that I mean. Uh, if I'm trying to communicate to you like a particular kind of tractor or whatever, and I don't know the word for it, or you don't know the word for it, and I use the word, and I have to draw the picture to show you what it means. Like, so there are other ways to symbolically represent the thing. Or if I couldn't find one to point at, you know, obviously, uh, you know, no, 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 the one with three wheels, or you know, whatever. Um, and I could draw the picture, and so I have this imperfect method of communicating. But the goal is that what the thing is, the thing that I have going on in my head, whether that's a concrete thing like a tractor or a very abstract thing like uh, what I mean by love or something like that, I want the same thing to generate in your head. And we have, <clears throat> excuse me, we have understanding. We have understanding when that intentionality becomes shared. 
And the goal of using language is to create that shared intention that we are both thinking of the same thing near enough for uh, for practical purposes at least, but ideally, depending on how deep we have to get, like maybe almost perfectly the same thing, which is funny because we literally can't know that because we are sub- subjectively locked. And we look for all, we use language and communication and all kinds of things to, to create signs and signals that you understood or I understood what the other person was saying. And that's really the purpose of language. So when you get to this crap like Derrida and the death of the author is that, you know, if I say a thing that you have a superior interpretation of what that thing meant, that that's a complete rejection. It's an inversion of the purpose of language. It's fun for like dicking around and being an artist, I guess, sort of, but not really. Uh, it's actually just fucking stupid. Um, I had something I intended and you don't get to super, imp- you, you could take something else from it and you, we could explore that as well, or you could do something with it. But you don't get to impose back on me that, oh, I understood what you said this way, so that's what you meant. Uh, and in fact, what you're doing at that point is breaking down the purpose of language. The purpose of language is to create the shared intention. If it's, you know, we're doing something together and I'm like, you need to go that way, then you need to understand what that way is and what, what when you need to go. That, like, there's, a, there's a, I have an intention for you strategically to do a thing. If we're playing sports or whatever, you need to run around the outside. Like, I need to communicate that to you one way or another and that you must understand it and must do the thing that's the same thing that I'm thinking of. So the same idea must enter into your head. So if you believe that you get to have authority and say, well, I interpreted it differently, so that's a valid interpretation, uh, you've broken down the point of communication. I mean, that's a perfectly fine linguistic thing you can do, and you can do whatever you want with your with ideas that enter into your head, but you can't impose the idea that... I meant something that I didn't mean because you thought something different. You can be mistaken, but you can't impose back on me that I secretly communicated X, Y, Z when in fact I'd said ABC or intended ABC. So there must be at some level a fundamental right to our own intention. But that gets back. This is all about meaning. This is all about meaning. We have a relationship to meaning, which is contained both in word and in, you know, symbol and whatever else. And even in abstract, complicated things like a story, a story itself, which is a very complicated thing made of many words, many images, many symbols, many things, uh, many interpretations. In fact, that thing, um, we have a relationship to that. Humans have a relationship to meaning. And so this allows me to get to the theology and to Newman. And so... The way that Newman frames theology, being that he's Catholic, is pretty surprising to me. He actually, in again, this is the idea of the university, he frames theology as a science of meaning. So all of a sudden, God, in the usual theological sense, is taken out of this. This is a science of meaning. And so what what Newman's basic argument is, is he says that theology is a science. That is, it's an organ, in his own description, he's very careful. It is an organized body of knowledge. That's all he means by a science. So it's a fairly broad definition of science. And in fact, doesn't even include necessarily the scientific method or empiricism or testing or any of this. Although I would argue that I think they apply through what we might call the old school used to call the school of hard knocks, or in other words, experiential learning. Uh, and, and it's like, if you think of, if you think of a theology or, or whatever, as a very broadly, uh, just to be very material, I understand my, my religious listeners are going to, going to balk at this, but just bear with me. If you think of it as a, um, non-scientific approach to, to psychology and sociology, that's actually, it, it's been, thousands of years really working out some good answers to psychological and sociological questions that we usually end up referring to as wisdom, which we then juxtapose against knowledge within like a scientific knowledge kind of sense. But Newman says that science is an organized body of knowledge, and he frames that theology is an, is a science. And in fact, it's a science of meaning. It's a, it's a science of relating meaning to concepts. And what his argument in this book is at least, I mean, this is the argument of the book, but this is what he frames out through the introduction and preface and the foreword that somebody else wrote, and I don't have it in front of me. It's a name I'm not familiar with, so I can't say who wrote the foreword to the edition that I have. Um, but but th- as a science of meaning, what, what his argument is, is that, that a university should be a thing that teaches all knowledge. And so if 
uh, all sciences really in the broad sense. Uh, so if if theology is a science and you exclude that from the university because say you know you say you have Catholics and Protestants at the same time and they're going to fight over the theology so you just leave it out. You overly secularize in a sense. He, what he what he says is that since all the sciences are ultimately connected, which is true, they actually are, uh, that if you fail to teach all of them, including theology, then you're not actually a university. But he actually warns, he goes much further, he warns that if theology is not present in the university, and again, I'm talk, when I say theology, I mean a science of meaning, a science of meaning. A science of wisdom you could even have, a maybe a love of wisdom, a philosophia, if you want. Um, if you don't have that, he says that the role of theology will be filled both wrongly and, appro- and inappropriately by the other sciences doing theology badly. And I would contend that this is exactly what's gone wrong in the university. Now, this is a different point than saying that the role of religion has fallen out of people in society. It's diminished, and therefore these political religions have arisen. This is different. This is that a robust... It's related, though, but it's different. This is more specific, and it's a more powerful uh, specificity. It is that what I would argue has happened is that we took... uh, Theology fell out of the university frame, and what we mean by theology is going to be... I'm going to leave that pretty much on the table right now. We're going to stick with just science of meaning. Uh, It could be anchored against God for the reasons I just said a moment ago, that I think that these are extraordinarily robust. uh, Theologies are extraordinarily, like the established ones are Christian theology or Catholic theology or Protestant theologies or whatever reformed theology are are actually extraordinarily robust theologies. uh, experiential sciences or proto sciences or something like that of of psychology and sociology that we would classify as wisdom, and so what I would contend has happened, and this has been my friend and I, Mike Nana, have been talking about this literally since 2017 and trying to figure out ways to articulate it. And I think I'm finally finding this way to articulate it is that the sociology department and the psychology department and the other so in the anthropology department and the other social sciences have stepped up into that role lacking a theology in the university a theological basis and they have filled that role with a bad immature science a very in, in, in a, uh, immature approximate and often agenda driven approach so the social sciences have decided to be the theologians of the university. And if Newman's warning is to be taken seriously, it's that you are now replacing a very mature, although perhaps mythological, he doesn't say that as far as I know, maybe he does further in the book, but not at the front. Um, I'll say it perhaps mythologically rooted, uh, that if we removed that in the, the theology, theology, the theology, um, role has been filled the theological role has been filled in badly by this we take out the mature thing and we replace it with this immature thing rooted in uh the social sciences which are extraordinarily immature still we don't even have the slightest idea how the human brain works and gets to psychology uh for example we sociology is extraordinarily complicated and it's so easy to do badly um that these things have kind of replaced even philosophy as the theological core. So philosophy could be a theological core of a university as a science of meaning. Um, but the social sciences have come in and usurped that role and done so badly. Um, now, obviously, for Newman being a Catholic, his, his, his articulation is that a theology is something a little bit more specific than just a science of meaning. That's more my interpretation of what he's written. He actually, just to be completely clear and fair, um, he argues that a the- he articulates, I should say, not argues, that a theology is an organized body of knowledge, in other words, a science about God that's derived both from nature and revelation. Now, this forces me to do a theological thing that, of course, my uh, theist, I hate that word, uh, my believing friends will will not like, is that I'm going to interpret God literally the same way that, that, that Aquinas does, but without calling it God, and this has been my thing for a number of years, I just believe that, that the, 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 the God is that which is, and that includes the ordering 
the, the natural ordering upon that which is. So you can study nature, including human nature, including sociological nature. Uh, and I don't, I'm not nodding towards psychology and uh, sociology, except as possible like adjuvant tools for this process. Uh, I don't think they should be theo- the theology department of anything, but God is that which is. I am the I am. Uh, and the order, you know, in kind of a Petersonian or Jungian order versus chaos kind of framework, it is, it is the idea of an overarching order to that which is. And we can study that. I would say, obviously, through nature, um, and Aquinas even agreed that, you know, nature is its own kind of revelation of, you know, God's, God created the world, as, as creator, God created the world. And so he revealed himself through his creation. Uh, and this is sort of a birthplace of the sci- natural sciences in a meaningful way anyway, as they arose in Europe. Um, revelation as far as uh, it goes for somebody like Newman, I would assume would mean scriptural revelation, particularly. Uh, maybe it means, you know, some kind of a you've prayed and you've had a uh, you know, you felt God's hand on you as it's often phrased or that, you know, you've been called to do something or, but I don't tech, I don't think, I don't think of that necessarily as revelation. And I don't think most people think of that as revelation. I think they think of revelation as the, the inspired scriptural word. And I would articulate that from a position outside of any particular belief system as being a very well, uh, organized, articulation of hard lessons learned both psychologically and sociologically. So a gigantic repository of wisdom that has, by virtue of the conditions through which it arose, the length of time that those conditions span and the uh, role that it played in guiding people's lives going forward in terms of what ended up being considered scriptural and not, uh, is actually genuinely a strong repository of wisdom as an organized body of knowledge then about that revelation uh, theology you know trying to parse out using logic and using you know various elements of say you know informed compassion or whatever to under to make sense of that uh, I would say that, you, that these very mature kind of, of theologies uh, match I, I don't think that my definition of theology matches, uh, sorry, differs from that of Newman with the lone exception that just like where Aquinas' five proofs all end in that this all men call God, I don't feel the need to do that. And if that makes me, you know, some kind of a believer in your eyes, cool. And if it doesn't, also cool. I don't care. Uh, but anyway, so this is Newman's argument, just in a nutshell, just to summarize that a university, by definition, is something that teaches all knowledge. And so if you have an organized body of knowledge that we would call a theology, which I would say is a science of meaning and a science of wisdom, that uh, if that's excluded, it's r- all the sciences, he says, are connected. That role that it plays can also not be ignored and will be filled in with other things. And so, for example, I think a very key theolo- we're often going to be talking then about theological virtues is, uh, and, and so a key theological virtue is humility and the humility that I think comes with accepting that, which is rather than saying that the point is to change that, which is, which is the Marx Marxian expression of Gnosticism, um, I think is absolutely core. You have this very healthy, oh, humble, uh, acceptance of the world as it is, whether that includes, you know, beliefs about the falling of man, whether it believes that the utopia heaven exists outside of the circle of the world. I think that's probably the most, I think that might be the most important. Um, um, it, I shouldn't say that. It's right up there with the most important ideas that Christianity brings to bear on the world is that the utopia is not a project of this world. It is outside of this world. Uh, grace is, of course. So, you know, this kind of forgiveness and turning the other cheek and, and everything that's connected to that is also a very key and important concept that come as kind of a mature theology would have. And what's, what's going to happen is that if you exclude these, that role is going to be filled in by something less mature and by something 
very activist. As a matter of fact, the Hegelian uh, becoming religion, if you will, steps into that role. And now we can shape the world or mold the world according to heart's desire. That's the Fabian glass that says that. Or the point is not to understand the world, but to change it. That's whether you want that to be Marx or whether you want that to be critical race theory and introduction on page three, you take your choice. Uh, and so these immature theologies and even pop psychology and pop sociology and p-hacked social science and stupid uh what do we call it uh uh cultural relativism through anthropology all of these kind of fucking idiotic immature ideas about humanity and how the world works are going to fill that role in because they answer questions of basic meaning about life they're going to fill that role in badly in a university if it excludes theology and so I agree with Newman. I don't know what the correct theology is, but, you know, for example, natural natural rights philosophy could be such a thing, and it could be more or less theistic in its approach, um, including even like deistic or as, as a way station in the middle where, you know, the belief is that God created and ordered the world, including human beings within it, but then doesn't intervene or have anything to do with our affairs and is not a person, God of personal relationship, etc., and therefore, you know, you, you though do have this belief that there's this thing you humble yourself before, um, rather than that everything is up for grabs and malleable, which is kind of manifested in the modern or postmodern era in the social construction thesis of things and everything's a social construction and that's just a new manipulation uh, of bad ideas. And it's become the theology though. And that's the point that Mike Nana and I have been trying to figure out how to communicate. It has become the theology and this is what Newman's about. So, um, I think that, that we have kind of two things happening then with Newman. The first is that um, he says that theology is necessary to the idea of a university, which, by the way, he also says is not a research institute. It is a teaching institute. It is a transmitter of ideas, knowledge, and virtues from one generation to the next at a for a university at a, in a you know young adult higher level. Uh, rather than you know primary or secondary education, and he says that, that that it's necessary to have those things in. But what I see this as is a kind of a, it's a, a systematic philosophy in a sense is a theology. But the problem is that a lot of those are crackpot like Hegel's uh, and even Kant's. Um, but they they are a a systematic organized body of knowledge on man's relationship with meaning, thus with information, with truth and falsity. So that makes it epistemological, but it's also therefore underlying, giving answers to ontological questions, the, the meaning of, ex, you know, the nature of existence. What does it mean to be? What does it mean to be human? Uh, those kind of ontological questions, but also axiological questions. What are the proper values and the virtues to apply in? And a mature theology as a science of meaning should actually have firm roots in a in an epistemological approach and in ontology and in axiology which it's a word that most of you probably haven't even heard of in other words it is a science a theology is a science of meaning and sense making and i agree with newman that a robust and mature science of meaning and sense making is necessary in any university context or even really broad more broadly as it filters out from the university in society um I agree with Newman when he makes this ultimate point that the other sciences, especially the uh, social sciences, lack the underlying developed principles. And that's how he frames it, that they are they, they're underdeveloped. They don't have the principles necessary, in particular the virtues necessary, the secular, the, you know, the, 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 the problem, the huge thing about science and scientism and all of this that the religious, the culture war 1.0 atheism versus religion argument we got into was that the, was that the, basically these kind of two rational idea or approaches lack the fundamental principles that religion provides. And then the atheists argued provide badly, but that's not necessarily even true, uh, that they lack those underlying principles to engage with the task of connecting meaning and sense making to all the other sciences. And in particular, the transmission of and uh, containment of virtues, I think, is, is relevant to this. Um, and so therefore, that these other approaches outside of a mature theology will either fail at it, like a naive scientific approach, or they will pervert it 
like a agenda-driven Marxist or eugenicist approach or something like that. And so for, for Newman, and I agree with him, any university or more broadly, any liberal education project must provide this foundation and meaning and sense making somehow. And it, uh, and I think a robust, mature science of meaning and sense making is necessary. And that's the thing we need to be looking for in our topsy turvy postmodern context where people are going to struggle to f- connect that in uh connect to that in kind of pre-modern religious ways for those who don't accept that approach. Um, as far as revelation, just to kind of roll back to that because it's so important to Newman and atheists and agnostics would not accept revelation. And the problem with revelation is that, you know, say Christians believe Christian revelation, but Muslims believe Muslim revelation. Uh, Catholics believe in kind of the primacy of uh, papal interpretation and revelation, whereas Protestants say you should go sola scriptura and go to the source, um, you have these different, the problem with revelation is, is you actually can't, and not to sound like a critical theorist, but you actually have to say who's revelation. <laughs> and it, this poses a specific challenge then to relate um, epistemology, ontology, and axiology, because there are people who have different revelatory traditions that don't agree with one another. Uh, and it, it, we don't want to fall into the interfaith trap, uh, which is um, a very kind of dangerous project that uh, all, and that there's a name for this, and I've said it in the past, and I can't think of it at the moment, but um, that all of the faiths contain seeds of the same truth and that we can kind of blend them together. I, I don't think that that's actually necessary or valuable. I think it's actually better that we each have our traditions and recognize that they're traditions and um, take them with a grain of salt if we are outside of them, uh, which is impossible from within because they are, if they're revealed, they are absolute truth. And that's something that I think in our, I don't know, in our our postmodern era that we're going to have to relax at a little bit. That, um, But something there is it has to give. I don't think that, I think that a a Protestant and a Catholic, for example, or an, an agnostic or atheist like myself and a Catholic or Protestant should be able to sit down and articulate how we view the world and gain from one another in terms of our own views of the world without having to sacrifice that we don't agree with it or sacrifice our own beliefs on the altar of the fact that we don't agree on everything. Uh, A very like limited you do you attitude as we might frame it today. Um, So there's a, there's a particular challenge though also, if we, when we, when we look at this problem that we somehow, if we're looking at a organized science or organized body of knowledge or science of meaning and, and sense making that boils down to having robust approaches to epistemology, ontology, and axiology. So that's theory of knowledge, theory of being, and theory of values, uh, that those things, there has to be a way to, 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 to deal with those, but we have this conflict or different traditions have different uh, takes on those. Um, I actually have my own very complicated views about how, uh, very complicated views about how axiology and ontology and epistemology actually all relate to one another and that you can actually root those firmly in nature in the natural world as it is. Um, so I think it's possible without going into a already developed theology, but, uh, the theologies are, in fact, already very mature approaches to this, although they rely on many pre-modern mythological elements. Um, when you look at Hegelianism and Marxism, you see then kind of an emerging new, and I'd say perverted, intentionally perverted, and maybe even with, when you get to Marx, openly satanic uh, in his own view, uh, but clumsy, self-serving, and evil kind of um, mid-modernist approach to coming up with this new systematic philosophy in the modern context that, uh, that jettisons the pre-modern context and tries to do this uh, in a new way, but poorly. Um, they're, because they they center theory, the Vernunft of uh, of or the 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 Wissenschaft Lichter Socialismus of of scientific socialism of Marx, um, they center theory uh, 
as the theology, but these things are, are ultimately kind of crackpot because they're dialectical and all of this. Um, but at any rate, I, I think that Newman is right, that you do need a theology. And I think that there's a big warning if you're leaving one out that it'll be filled in by other things and that those things could be just naive and stupid and dangerous, or they could be evil and agenda driven and perverted and dangerous like Marxism. And uh, a mature theology provides a framework and actually a force field that keeps this stuff out. So some organized body of knowledge regarding man's relationship to meaning and sense making is necessary within the university context, even if it's just to, uh, to, to articulate and relate the theory of knowledge, the theory of being, and the theory of values. So epistemology, ontology, and axiology. Uh, and I think that he's right that it's, that it's necessary. A mature theology provides this framework sufficiently that it's both preposterous and reckless merely to dismiss it as, say, mere superstition. So this is getting the Jordan Peterson's kind of pragmatic argument for the so-called truth of religion. I don't think it's a truth of religion argument. It's a practicality of religion, practicality of a wisdom tradition, which is different than its... The wisdom of religion is different from the truth of religion. Uh, but this is a very Jordan Peterson kind of thing. We shouldn't recklessly dismiss it. I think uh, theologies as mere superstition. We also shouldn't, we can't, if Newman's right, exclude them uh, just entirely because they rely upon certain assumptions um, that are either viewed as mythological or that are vigorously controversial across denominational and other lines of difference in faith. So, for example, you may rankle at the idea that I say Christianity is ultimately mythological in its construction, for example, but every Muslim believes that too. And we could flip that over and do it to Islam, and the Muslims can get upset and the Christians would say the same thing. Um, so, our relationship to meaning, I think, can be understood somehow. Like This is where people are like, we need to get back to religion, and it's like, it's not going to work, but I don't know what to do. The religions get subverted too. But what actually has to happen is that when you have a mature and robust theory of meaning, science of meaning, that becomes pretty solid. And I think that at the end of the day, you know, boiling down, whether it's studying scripture for authorial intent to understand the tradition that way as a theological exercise, whether that's, you know, uh, I guess that's through exegesis primarily, but there are techniques for that, um, or whether that's through, you know, meditation and contemplation or whatever. Um, there needs to be some mature theological science of meaning that's underlying everything that's going on and that it must somehow relate back to some fundamental right that we have to be taken at our meaning that we intend and to use communication to root out that meaning as we intend. And somehow our information space must develop not just a statement or articulation of this right to meaning, but also uh, incentive structures, etc., that enable that to, to come to the fore and flourish. And um, that is the project that we face right now, I think, in some weird uh, sense, but the fundamental right to um, one's own intentions and meaning, I think, somehow at the bottom of this. And I think that Newman's probably right, though, that a mature theology uh, grants the ability to do that. Um, so right from the preface, for example, in the idea of the university, Newman argues that the, theo the, the theology itself cannot be the basis of the university. So I don't want to give you some idea that he's some weird theocrat. It's in fact a very liberal book on what a liberal education should look like in a society. And he says, because it has other duties and the university's actual duties are to diffuse and extend universal knowledge, which is to say to teach. And so theology has other commitments, has other things to do, but you still need that. So this isn't that we should have explicitly religious. His argument is not that we should have explicitly religious universities. It's that theology of some stripe or another as a mature tradition needs to be contained within the university in order to, uh, to, to prevent, I should say, not exclude, prevent naive and perverse uh, replicas from, or simulations or simulacra, I guess, from stepping into that role and causing great harm where something more mature and stable might prevent it. But it's not the role of the university to become a church. 
He says, in fact, that the university depends on the church, and so does theology, for its integrity. But that's not the same thing as the university becoming a church. And this is, of course, again, what I think, and Mike Nana agreeing with me, has gone wrong, that the university has become a church or a cathedral, as some people refer to it, uh, notably Curtis Yarvin coining that, uh, although means it a bit more broadly. So let me say that again, because Newman's very clear on this. The university depends on the church for its integrity. In other words, it depends on the theology for its integrity, but it cannot be a church. It has a different task. It is not ministering to people. It is not ministering, it's not telling people necessarily even how they ought to live. Uh, it is not doing the ministerial role. It's also um, not necessarily doing the kind of outreach and uh, which you could say is social activism, you know, to, to minister to the poor or the widows or the orphans or whatever it happens to be, those duties. The church has different duties, but the theology at the heart of the church, and that's what the capital C per Newman, the theology, at, and it doesn't have to be the Catholic church. I know he means it that way, but I don't think it has to be that way. The theology at the heart of the church lends it integrity to any intellectual system that connects to it and relies upon it. And again, I'm not making a case for any particular theology, whether Reformed or Catholic or, or Muslim or Buddhist. I'm talking about any of them that are mature. And it could even be one that's kind of deistic and natural law-based that has absolutely no, or even uh, agnostic or atheistic and natural law-based, which, you know, work out that contradiction where the natural laws come from. Nature's stupid. Um, that human nature is real in a limited set, limited constrained system. And so, okay, never mind. Uh, you know what I'm saying. You maybe you don't, but you should think about it. Uh, so his claim, though, is that the neither the church nor the university can perform its essential function if it's trying to be the other thing. But at the same time, the university can't perform its function correctly without a theological core that gives it integrity, and it needs a working science of meaning and sense making in order to have integrity. And um, what that does is should or what it should do is provide the underlying context for all knowledge. In other words, relating epistemology, a theory of knowledge, ontology, a theory of being, and axiology, a theory of values, because it, those things must be somehow related to have a robust and thorough understanding. And he says that we need a theology, which we're going to use as a mature science in this sense, uh, as a expression of man's relationship to, inf as I see it, as man's relationship to meaning has to be brought through in this mature expression or else you're setting yourself up for a catastrophe, um, which is what's happened. This is what has happened. Our, our social sciences driven universities, uh, thinking that the administrators and professors thinking of themselves wise have become fools, uh, have believed that they don't need a mature working understanding a meaning, they have a new one, a better one, a scientific socialism, perhaps a fair nunft, a higher systematic reason above uh, the facts of the world. Uh, their interpretive framework can't be so pre-modern and, and backward, backwards. We have to have a modern one and now a postmodern one going forward. And the university has, in, in a sense, replaced the church as the anchor of society and it's unfortunately full of shit. It's as bad and corrupt as, as you know, the most corrupt religious organization you can imagine at its height of corruption. But it's also completely arrogant in believing that it can be separated from this. By the way, this is a little Marxian side note. Marx actually believed that human beings to be truly independent had to be in themselves they had to be wholly independent. They can't be the creation of God. They can't even necessarily be the product of nature. They have to be the product of human relations, of history, as he called it. Uh, and so man has to be man in himself if he's truly independent. Otherwise, he's dependent on either nature that formed him or God that created him. And so his is a rejection of the natural order intentionally, and his is a rejection of the theological order the, the, from God intentionally, which is why he's ultimately satanic. Uh, and the same myth that plays out in Genesis could be applied to uh, Marx um, with the snake, that one. And that's why what he's doing is ultimately Gnosticism um, and not a good project. Uh, 
So Newman then wants to kind of articulate what is the essential function of the university, or if we're going to look at uh, saying a university can't fulfill its essential function without a mature th- theology behind it, um, we have to ask, what is that essential function? Not in its behavior, but in terms of the role that it plays in broader society. And this is where it's, I think, so important and key. And this is where what I just said becomes so pertinent. It's the center of intellectual life for a society, which is therefore a foundational component component of its culture. As goes the university, as we see in the world, as goes the university, soon follows everything else in society. Soon follows the Geist, if we want to put this kind of in Hegelian terms, the zeitgeist, the spirit of the times, the weltgeist, the the world spirit that develops as a broad cultural frame. Um, the The society in general gets dragged along wherever the university, or actually wherever the center of intellectual life goes. So at first, at one point in history, the church was the center of intellectual life and has been replaced by the university as the center of intellectual life. So where, what is it? Where, whither goeth the university, so goeth the society and the culture. That's the role the university plays. And so imagine then you have this thing that's now got a, perver- a naive and or a perverse uh, the- theology, a naive one where People think that a robust science of meaning that relates knowledge, being, and uh, values um, is unnecessary and tangential, a totally technical school, if you will, a totally tech, you know, Institute of Science and Technology divorced from uh, just, just focus in a sense on epistemology without even a grounding of where epistemology gets its roots. Um, but it's just focused on, and no interest in ontology and very little or no interest in axiology. Eugenics, for example, grows out of this kind of coldly scientific, amoral framework that we've been warned about this for a very long time. It's it's a bad idea. Um, So what if it's perverse, though? What if it's adopted, say, you know, scientific socialism as its theology, its Gnostic theology? Well, that's a catastrophe as well. And we've seen what's happened to societies that have attempted to do that. Uh, Millions, tens of millions dead. It's a a complete catastrophe. Um, The arrogance in such a project is just horrific. So you can imagine a society that has been stripped at the level of its intellectual core, the university in modern societies and even postmodern societies to a degree, that has been stripped of any mature theology. You could say that the media environment is part of this. The, the thing that Yarvin calls the cathedral broadly, academia, media, politics, kind of the cultural institutions kind of stuck together, the cathedral to replace the old church. Yarvin has tapped into something actually. I'm not, I mean, I met Curtis, we got along great, but then we, uh, he doesn't like me now or something. And so I guess I don't like him because that's how that works. Uh, no, I don't care. I, I'm not in on his program, but I think he, he, he has identified something extraordinary here that the church got replaced by the cathedral. And the cathedral is this uh, conglomerate of, of cultural production entities. Um, and imagine that being stripped wholly of any mature theology and replaced with either a naive one, an immature naive one, or an immature, petulant, perverse one, an angry toddler or angry teenager rebelling against the society that it's angry at and resentful of. Um, it's a catastrophe in the making. Um so if Newman's right about the role of theology, then an incompetent or perverse theology will fill the void of the mature theology at the heart of the university. And then this will establish, will will attempt to establish and will do so, do so badly, the relationship between man and meaning, man and information, man and sense making. And so the spirit that animates society going forward will then be underdeveloped or degenerate. The society will stagnate list about, fall into corruption, become poisoned, eventually unravel, basically, if not become a catastrophe uh, of the kind that, you know, the Nuremberg Convention was was held to to answer to. Uh, Saving such a society in the long run, therefore, requires renewing whatever the center of intellectual life and cultural production is, broadly the cathedral, so university, media, academia, etc., You have to renew that university's relationship to a mature theology, which is a science of meaning, or create a replacement that functions in the same position. So 
what I'm saying is that the existing cathedral either has to, if we want to go forward from here in a positive way, the existing cathedral either has to be recaptured and be given a fundamental grounding in a mature theology, which I'm telling you, if it's sectarian, it's not going to work. That not that way, Western man, uh, it, that's, that's its own catastrophe, a, th- a theocracy or even a monarchy. This is where I depart from Yarvin. Uh, on the monarchy, and I depart from many in the kind of Catholic wing of the neo-reaction movement on the uh, the theocracy, uh, that's not going to work going forward. It's just going to be a new tyranny because it's not relatable to most people, and it has to be therefore interjected and forced upon them. It's not going to work. The uh, So if we can't recapture with a kind of very liberal um, broad-minded theology, again, a theory of meaning. In other words, a mature understanding of the relationship between epistemology, which is a theory of knowledge, ontology, which is a theory of being, being, and axiology, which is a theory of values. If a mature thing of that kind can't get put back into it and save it, then we must replace the existing cathedral with a new thing that has a new, or that is based in some kind of a mature science that relates uh, knowledge, meaning, or knowledge, being, and values to create a robust science of meaning. And if that's not there, listen, to, reading Newman. If that's not there, we're just on the road to disaster. And I think he's right. Um, what is a what is it? What would it look like if we um, if we had such a thing? Well, that's where societies function and flourish until they become degenerate or corrupt by letting those things fall by the wayside. Um, you know, maybe this is one of those things that people think is a cyclical process of history. Time is a flat circle. Time is a flat circle, yeah, I, I, something like that. Um, but if you look at a, at a at a society as the thing that proceeds from its center of intellectual life, the university, or before that, the church, uh, if you look at a society that that doesn't possess a mature theology uh, or effective means of relating it, and thus, in the, in the modern era, the modern sense, a healthy and complete university as its ideal guarantor, um, that a society lacking that is going to suffer the same corruption, but faster and more fatally even than the institution, um, because its means of understanding and maintaining itself has become completely lacking. So um, something that fills in this role of a mature theology, and it could be a theology that's fairly mature, but... Uh, it's not going to work if that thing uh, is taken up as the one and only true way. You're just going to get sectarian conflict again if you try to do this, like we had in the you know the religious wars following the the uh, the Reformation. What you actually have to have is something like I tried to describe earlier, where people can can not lose their own tradition while disagreeing with people. Uh, who are in other traditions, who are also not losing their own tradition through the disagreement, but that are enriching and deepening their own. They're they're deepening their understanding of epistemology, uh, uh, ontology, and axiology through their relationship with the science of meaning is A, sectarian, but B, secular enough to realize that that's okay, that they don't all agree. Um, a society, though, without, a, without its complete university is going to rot. That's Newman's warning, and I think it's right. Uh, it is going to become degenerate in precisely this way because the university is our center of intellectual life. And so either we have to replace the university with something that fulfills this role, or we have to reclaim the so-called cathedral, the university, broadly, uh, and install something like a mature theology that replaces both the naive, scientific one and the perverse, um, kind of Hegelian, Marxian one that have, have kind of colonized those with their... Again, thinking themselves wise, they became fools is kind of the key uh, biblical verse to insert into the theological discussion. Now, just to kind of frame this all out, like kind of in a broad historical context, then I'm just going to wrap up the, back to where I started. Um, you know, just historically speaking, a big picture, the advent of the modern era out of the pre-modern era could actually be framed as the emergence of the university from the church into this role of center of intellectual life. Um, the risk of modernity then is that the university would replace the church in its theological role without having a mature theology at its heart, uh, that stages a perilous temptation that allows the university to get kind of too big for its britches or too Gnostic for its britches or thinking themselves wise to become fools and forget that it, 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 the actual theology that makes it work 
uh, isn't present. In fact, well, the university, the better way to put it would be that the university would, can easily forget in this transition from pre-modern, pre-modernity to, to modernity, the university could easily forget that the, that, um, the, it isn't theology. It is a handmaid to theology. Uh, its role is to serve the, the underlying science of meaning and to relate all of the different aspects of knowledge uh, within its purview that way. And again, I point out that any mature such thing is going to have a, have a robust theory of knowledge. That's an epistemology, a robust theory of being, an ontology, and a robust theory of values, which is an axiology. And those things are going to have to be related in some unified fashion that actually makes sense, uh, that is cohesive, that people can can understand and contextualize the meaning in their life, the meaning in their the other avenues of their knowledge. Why don't you do eugenics if science says, oh, well, we're biological and we can therefore you know, modify the human organism? Why don't we do transhumanism? You know, or if we're going to go into aspects of that, how do we do so ethically? All of that requires a very mature theology so that we're not making the kinds of errors that right now we're not even sleepwalking our way into. We're actually, we're not even running. We're being shot out of a cannon like Evil Knievel or something toward. Uh, and that's because um, the theology has fallen, it, the, the role of a robust science of meaning as a theology has fallen away. Um, so this is where we can see that actually the crisis, the defining crisis that we, we, we've been going through of late modernity, the last hundred years, uh, which is the establishment of a cathedral, to use Curtis Yarvin's term for it, that doesn't have a gen, genuine heart, or in fact, that has a blackened heart, um, but also that gets to set the tone for capital T truth, in its deficient and ge- degenerate voice. Um, again, in thinking themselves wise, they became fools. Um, of course, if you just dip out, because this is what I do, into the critical theory, if you read the dialectic of enlightenment from Horkheimer and Adorno from the 1940s, the critical Marxist school of thought, this is maybe the most uh, complete articulation of critical theory. If you read the dialectic of enlightenment, um, what they're saying is this, what they're describing is essentially this, but badly and in a weirdo Marxian, Marxian way where the goal is to replace the dying theology of the Enlightenment era with uh, their Marxist perversion of it. But what they're saying is that as this theology degenerates at the center of intellectual life, as the, as the science of meaning gets removed and becomes less important and degenerates in the intellectual center of a society as they claim is the inevitable process of enlightenment uh, inevitable consequence of enlightenment then what happens is madness and irrationality flow from the belief in rationality and so the, 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 they they depict a gradual slide throughout the modern era away from a modern uh, from a mature theology into these kind of naive ones uh, and they they therefore are proposing that the critical theory or a critical marxism will be able to step in and be in weakness perversion grows in decay uh, corruption flourishes where where there is something uh, has broken, that's where the mold is going to grow. And that's what's happening here. Then the dialectic of enlightenment is kind of a chronicle of this saying, oh, look how weak the, the central theology of Western civilization, of the enlightenment uh, has, has decayed. Uh, we've moved away from this. There is no robust theology and everything that was rational has become irrational. And everything that was um, sane has become insane. That's the dialectic of enlightenment progressing. And by the way, we have an answer and it's the critical philosophy. And so the, the rot grows in the wound. The gangrene of Marxism grows in the kind of crushed toe that's not getting the blood flow, if you will. So you can think of the theology as providing, you know, nourishing blood flow to the to the limb and it goes too long and it goes gangrenous. And that's the Marxism growing in. And you can see the the, the, the infection being inserted into that wound in the dialectic of enlightenment. Um, so what you could also see there, you could name uh, the observation here uh, is the university has forsaken in its arrogance its status as the child of the church, and it has st- it set itself up instead as the rightful successor to the church. Uh, and I'm using church again, capital C, very broadly. I don't mean any particular church. And this is, again, that same, and I mean it, satanic inversion 
uh, that characterizes the critical philosophy that Marx put out very explicitly. Uh, and it doesn't matter if you believe in Satan or not. If Satan's a myth to you, fine. It is the the deceiver, the uh, the inversion of the natural order of the good, the rebellion and rejection of God, the intentional uh, attempt to steal away and create on on his own terms. But if we dip into the Tolkien legendarium here, you know, Melkor, the Satan character of uh, the enemy, the Satan character of, of that, that theology uh, cannot create, but can only mock. Um, and so this, this inversion gets in, gets embraced and pressed into ideological service in that state of theological decay. And I think that a lot of people are intuiting around this, but we're not doing it very well. Um, so rather than decrying, uh, these perversions like Marxian theories as they come in, um, they're being, they're being pressed into the, into the service. And so what we could actually describe this as, as a Gnostic turn or a Marxist turn, but a Gnostic turn of the university has been laid bare in this discussion. And that's the problem that we face that the, the, the the university forgot that it was the child of the church. The universities were originally seminaries. They were originally theological centers, and they were therefore uh, handmaids to to the theology. And now they've inverted that. Now they, they, they have forgotten that they're the child of the church, and they believe that they're the successor, the rebellious teenager that's wrecking himself. But they're as the university goes or as the cathedral goes, so goes the society. The center of intellectual and cultural life of a, of a society dictates where the society is going. And um, what you have with these stupid Marxian theories, like in the dialectic of enlightenment or whatever, is that whether it's the church, whether it's the theology, whether it's the cathedral, is framed as the jailer of mankind, not the source of a true theology. Um, that's, again, the Genesis myth um, becoming relevant again. Uh, and so these thin and inadequate and perverse, um, immature theologies, uh, at the heart of the atheological university that without a theology, a university or cathedral without a theology, um, are susceptible to the maneuvers of the ideologists who come in with their ideology in place, their Marxian ideology, for example, in place of a mature theology and ideology is an immature theology. Then we could think of it that way. And they replace, uh, you have a decrepit theology at the heart of the university that gets replaced by a ideology, uh, a decrepit theology replaced by ideology. And then the catastrophe is coming. Um, kind of a big theory of, of ideology here. Uh, and frankly, the, the 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 ones who are the Gnostics driving this are a problem with their capital T theory. But then the rest of the theor- theologically impoverished professorate is, as, is asleep at the wheel because they don't have a robust science of meaning underneath and relating all of the different aspects of their high-minded knowledge. They don't have the toolkit necessary to push out the gangrene, to push out the rot, to call it out and to fight against it. Um, now... I think that this is uh, a good diagnosis of what happened through much of the 20th century. But when we get to the last part, something very important happened, which was the advent of postmodernity. And so we have to understand what postmodernity is. Postmodernity is an era in time. Uh, John Francois Leotard's 1979 book was called The Postmodern Condition, and it describes what it means to live in postmodernity. The way that I'm going to define postmodernity is the era of the dominance of narratives and images, thus of propaganda. And postmodernism can be boiled down to the belief that all statements are propaganda, in a sense. Postmodernism is this extraordinary skepticism of anything. Every, every, every articulation, every statement is somehow propagandist. It's somehow rooted in political power uh, and a- attempts to uh, maintain or entrench or, or whatever dominance for some group or another and who, who has control over the ability to claim that what they're doing is, is true or knowledgeable. And so um, the thing is, is the post Marxist left beat the rest of the world to describing postmodernity. So we don't have a robust theory of postmodernity, of meaning in postmodernity. We don't have one because we only have the shitty Marxist one. 
that came out of the postmodernists in France and then their their successors who became, for example, the post-structuralist feminists who basically ruined everything. They're the ones who imported postmodernism and they basically ruined everything. Uh, and again, they're a very resentful um, group. They had a very strong agenda, which was to abolish gender roles completely. They saw that the postmodern theory uh, as a deconstructive acid could digest gender roles completely. Now they're dealing with the fact that it also digested sex and they're screwed if they're actual feminists because feminism doesn't mean anything unless there is sex and they've screwed themselves. But um, so it goes. We don't have, or maybe one's beginning to emerge. We don't have a robust theory of the postmodern condition from a position that accepts a mature Theology And again, a th mature theology is a mature science of meaning. And a science of meaning is one that's going to relate epistemology, ontology, and axiology uh, so that we can contextualize information and define man's relationship to meaning itself. Postmodernism dissolves man's relationship to meaning. Uh, so the postmodern era has to be understood. And we have to understand also that we, whether we like it or not, we live in postmodernity now, given that we live in an era of narratives and images. The internet. We live, I mean, look, the Facebook's trying to introduce meta, the metaverse, which is literally a blending of, of digitally enhanced or digitally enabled hyper reality, a strictly postmodern concept with reality, kind of a, a hyper real overlay of actual reality where you can actually live in pretend, right? So postmodernity is here. We don't have a mature theology that articulates this. The only one that was given was by angry leftists. This is a huge problem. This is a huge gap. We don't have a robust theory of meaning in the postmodern era. We only have shitty ones that are really going to do a lot of damage that actually are nihilistic, that dissolve a sense of being, a sense of essence. They have a perverted axiology, a perverted theory of values. As a matter of fact, their primary axiology is to um, subvert the existing order. It is a, a re rebellion and a rejection against satanic, just to point that out, since we're being theological here. They don't have a robust epistemology. Their, their theory of knowledge is that knowledge is an assertion of power, which is an incredibly cynical and dangerous way to think about everything. They don't have a, uh, a mature ontology either. They're very anti-realist that everything's symbols and words and that the words mean what people want them to mean. And they dissolve, this is where we started in this podcast, they dissolve your relationship to, to what you mean so that your intention and what you're trying to communicate to build the shared intention across the theory of language isn't possible. That's the only theory of the era and time that we occupy and that are, we are rocketing further into right now. Um, the postmodern era has been dominated by postmodernist philosophy, which is poison. Uh, it's a cynical and nihilistic skepticism of all theologies, both mature and immature, as though they're the same thing, that they're all a mythology that's all going to cause this huge problem. And it's, uh, I think that the postmodern Philosophy actually, first of all, they were disillusioned Marxists. Khrushchev had confessed, confessed to Stalin's sins, and they were very disillusioned. And they certainly weren't going to become capitalists, and they certainly weren't going to become liberals, and they didn't really have anywhere to go except this nihilism. But if you actually looked at the way that, you know, they always bring up positivism, if you actually look at the way of what that the, the university as the center of intellectual life by the middle of the 20th century had actually kind of rejected a mature theology, they saw the shallowness and the failure of the corrupt theology at the heart of society. These postmodernists weren't just despairing of the loss of Marxism. They were also despairing of the loss of a mature theology at the heart of society. They just saw everything as corrupt and shallow and fake and thus political. And so with a, a vacuum of any true theology and the challenge being that no particular sectarian, whether it's Catholic, whether it's Protestant, whether it's Muslim, whether it's Buddhist, no sectarian theology can possibly be believed in the modern era because they're all pre-modern. You have this massive gaping hole that's being filled by perverse ideologies. And in fact, identity politics as a new faith filled that gap. Because that radical skepticism and anti-theology of despair that characterizes the postmodern theory described by the post-Marxist left in the 70s and 80s and 90s that 
while the conservatives were asleep at the wheel completely on this, um, it's only in that state that the ideologists, the critical theorists, the Marxists could actually come in and supplant all of the natural theologies on a broad scale, get people to focus um, very narcissistically on identity, like it's a religion, like it's the religion, and that identity must be understood uh, in terms of uh, um, politics. Um, this is what's actually happened, is is that... Um, Capitalizing on the weakness of the 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 theological weakness of the society through the latter half of the twentieth century, the ideologists were able to pervert them and kind of like I've referred to it as like a gangrene or gangrenous thing that blood flow was suppressed and not good coming into the limb, and it's become gangrenous in that regard and. Uh, a robust theology lacking is kind of the space in which that happened. And postmodernism is this, right? They recognize both the changing environment and this weak shallowness uh, of theology at the center of intellectual life. And they were able to, and the fact that there's sectarian ones are in conflict and therefore can't possibly all be right. And people become skeptical of them. Uh, they, they were able to interject in, inject into the situation uh, the ideology to replace theology, and now we're in this very perverse era. So this is a big freaking problem, but I think it's a pretty good diagnosis of what's going on. It also hints to us what the answer to getting out of this mess looks like in a big picture scale. I mean, there's lots of little things to do, showing up to school boards and so on to fight back, but in the big picture scale... What we have to understand is that the center of intellectual life, which we could call the church or the cathedral, has lost its theology and has taken up a gangrenous poisoned one. We have to understand, so so what has to happen is that either has to be, be amputated, has to be cleared out and cleaned out uh, and healed, it has to be renewed in some way, but what actually has to fill in is a mature theology. But then we have to understand what a theology w- would look like a mature theology would look like in a postmodern era that can contend with the challenges of living in the era of time that we actually occupy. And uh, it's where we start looking for that is an articulation of, again, it has to have a mature approach to epistemology. And of course, the natural sciences do a wonderful job of this and can be a strong basis for it, but they lack value judgment. They also lack a theory. The religious people point this out all the time. They can't justify it. Science can't justify itself. Um, so it lacks a robust ontology. Uh, so an axiology and an ontology are, are also necessary in addition to a robust epistemology. And we've been thinking ourselves wise and being fools and thinking that just a robust epistemology would be enough. And then here comes critical theory swooping in uh, like a like a gangrene on a, on a strangled limb, lacking that theology, and it has stepped in and it has uh, taken on the role of both ontology, we're going to understand everything in terms of power, and axiology, which is also going to be that we're going to understand everything in terms of remediating uh, differences in outcomes or differences in power uh, and the, their outward signs through absolutely piss poor, immature, but also Gnostic, therefore satanic theory uh, in place of theology. And so developing that must be the thing. But we go back to Newman. And what, what Newman articulates is that a theology is a science of meaning, a organized body of knowledge of meaning that relates that, that articulates and relates epistemology, axiology, and ontology. No, those are those are my additions. I don't want to put words in Newman's mouth, but I think that that's what's there. And that means that at the heart of what we're dealing with is that we've had a shift into postmodernity, even a shift into modernity. That was its, its own thing 500 years ago, really. Um, but now we've shifted into postmodernity, and what we lack is a science of meaning. And in fact, what we lack is a way to articulate uh, on firm ground, what man's relationship to meaning actually is. Uh, and the this way lies a solution. And again, I point, just to wrap it back to the beginning, I point toward what Locke understood in terms of securing freedom of particularly conscience and speech, which opens up all kinds of things, and the necessity in order to have those of securing the rights to life, liberty, and property. So certainly, given the the encroaches that encroachments that we're experiencing now against those, we must rearticulate. We must reestablish very firmly and on, I would say, even theological grounds, whether that's natural rights or whatever, 
we must articulate very firmly, yes, we must have a right to our life, we must have a right to our liberty, we must have a right to our property. As we step into this emerging um, marketplace of ideas, but we also must have an inalienable right not to have meaning imposed upon our ideas. If we're going to increasingly live in an idea-driven or information-driven space, the meaning that we intend must mean something. And there must be an inalienable right not to have our meaning overwritten by other people and to have those people taken seriously within that marketplace. Uh, I don't quite know how all this works. I don't know what the answer is, but this is the direction that I'm pointing, reading, thinking, you know, so welcome to the second enlightenment. Buckle up and enjoy your ride. It's going to be a bumpy, bumpy transition. But I think we have to understand that something like a mature science of meaning, a mature theology, a mature science of wisdom, if you want, or wisdom in science in a very broad sense, organized body of knowledge, uh, that also understands that um, we must have some kind of security placed in our relationship, not just to be able to express what we mean, that's what Locke provided, but also to be able to retain what we meant and have it mean something in the first place. I think that, and then also, of course, how that relates to finding meaning in ourselves without having to find it literally in ourselves, like, oh, I'm a, you know, something demigender, something, something, blah, 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 sexual with a twisted romantic, you know, dangling testicle or whatever the fuck identity categories you have to have. We shouldn't be finding that in a narcissistic reflection into ourselves, but rather in identity politics, really but rather uh, in something that, that, that appeals to our common humanity and it appeals to our, our, our individualism, uh, which I think are correct. Um, so that's what's missing. That's what's needed, a recognition that here we are in post-modernity. We don't know what to do with this. The only articulation of our condition is given by whack job, French philosophers that have terrible ideas and they hate things, are nihilistic and are, are narcissistic. And we've now replaced, whether through identity Marxism order, we've now replaced a robust science of meaning with kind of navel gazing and identity politics and such shallow, awful things, a gangrenous, a gangrenous development in a strangled limb whose circulation depends on a mature theology, a mature science of meaning, and a way, therefore, that we can relate to what we mean and have... Um, an inalienable right that our that what we mean by what we say or what we write or what we intend matters in some very significant regard. Uh, I think that's where we are and how we navigate this. the The best hint I have still remains that we have to be able to sit across from one another in very different theological traditions that are nonetheless deep, whether Catholic versus Protestant versus Muslim versus you know natural law deistic or natural law agnostic or whatever it happens to be, we have to be able to sit across from one another, not feeling those differences as a threat to our faith, but rather as an opportunity to deepen it while we relate to one another as, you know, common members of a much bigger project of humanity. That way is forward. I'm not sure what it looks like. I don't think it's my lot to figure it all out. But this is what I'm thinking. This is my theology discussion. We need a theology. A theology doesn't, and it needs to be mature. And it doesn't necessarily need to be any particular one or even a faith-based one. But we do need a robust science of meaning that relates these key components, knowledge, being, what it means to be, what it, what do we, how do we know things? How do we claim that something is true? And then also, what values and virtues are necessary to navigate life? So that's where I'm thinking now. I'm excited about the Second Enlightenment. I hope this is a good bridge into my educational podcast, which are going to begin shortly. Um, so thank you for listening to this rather experimental line of thought. Uh, we'll catch you next time. <laughs>